Well, welcome. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, I know some of you have actually even escaped Christmas parties to be here, just so you know. Big draw, Ian. Um, not worse for wear yet, I don't think, Sam. Um, it's the Materials Christmas Party also, by the way. So uh, it's, a, it's really a great pleasure to be of the Energy Futures Lab annual lecture. Um, slight housekeeping before we start. Um, we're not expecting any fire alarms. If you do hear a fire alarm, please leave the building by the nearest exit. So out this way, out of the front, out onto Prince Consort Road. At the most important is over the road from the building. Okay. Hopefully that's not going to happen. Ian is um, very um, pleased after the lecture to have some questions. So we're going to have a Q&A at the end. Um, there's going to be some roaming mics in the room if you're online. Um, there's going to be a Slido available um, for you to post your questions there. You can do that anonymously if you need. I can't imagine what kind of question you want to ask that needed to be anonymous, but that's an option. Okay, so I'm sure you're all aware that Energy Futures Lab is one of our seven global challenge institutes. Um, it's founded in 2005, so it's been going very strong. Its reputation is growing year on year. Um, our speaker this year is the chair of the advisory board. Um, and it works across the college, across all of the faculties to really bring together critical mass of energy research to help us attain a sustainable energy transition. And, it, and it's critical really to the work of the college in, in convening our academics, in helping us deliver real world impact and, and really exhibiting thought leadership in this space. And it's been doing so under the guidance of various directors and co-directors over the year. And currently we have Anna and Peter as the, the co-directors. And I'm taking this opportunity also to thank you for your work in not just tonight and organizing tonight, but, uh, but running the Institute. Um, at Imperial, we are, I think, proud to say that we're systems thinkers. So we like to think outside the box. And what Energy Futures Lab does is, is work along with our other challenge institutes, the Grantham in particular, to think about those systems level challenges that we need to address for the energy transition. So I'm not going to talk for too long. Our speaker today, um, Ian Fennell, has got a deep understanding of what these challenges are and, and what we need to do to meet some of these challenges. You're currently the chair of um, the Energy Futures Lab Advisory Board um, and was appointed chair of the National Nuclear Laboratory in January of this year. And it says here, Ian, you've had a long and distinguished career in the global energy sector. And long and distinguished, right, I'm, I'm leaving it there. Um, you did join ABB in 1999, um, Director of Projects, Managing Director of Scottish Hydro, um, and CEO of ABB UK, um, before becoming CEO of Hitachi ABB Power Grids. Um, Clearly, you've got a huge experience across the sector, networks in the community, and, and I think what's not here is a long-standing, deep relationship with Imperial College and the Energy Futures Lab, for which we are very grateful. Um, you're going to talk to us about nuclear, and I notice all of our nuclear colleagues, are, they're, they're not identifiable, the nuclear colleagues, but um, I, know, I, know who you, I know who you are. Um, <laughs> And I hope we're going to hear some, some interesting challenges. Nuclear, of course, has got an, an interesting history. The UK has had long-standing, really deep excellence and expertise in driving nuclear technology. And I think still has the potential to transform some of the, the global energy systems. Nuclear is now firmly, I think, back on the map in thinking about how we use nuclear going forwards. There are obvious challenges technologically, um, societally, in geopolitics that I hope Ian is going to touch on. Um, but also understanding where nuclear applies more widely, not just in energy, but across, across medicine and other technologies. So, without further ado, I would, it is really my great honour to invite Ian Fennell to deliver this year's Energy Futures Lab Lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mary, it's, uh, for that very, very kind um, and uh, almost correct introduction. Thank you very much. Um, oh, now I see if there's any batteries in here. No. There's your Slido. So for those that want to take the details down, please do so. Um, uh, also, yes, I, I, I recognize the nuclear uh, experts. They were in first, uh, and they're in the front rows. And, and they're maybe slightly older than the average um, around the room. So, so yes, welcome. Uh, I also have my CEO here, so if there's anything really, really difficult and challenging technically, I'm going to ask him to answer the question. 
Um, it's a great honour and a privilege to be here. It's, it's, I mean, I love this place. Uh, Mary said I've, I've, I've been had a long relationship with, with Imperial, and, and I just, it's, it's a great honour to, to be here and to be able to deliver this lecture today. Um, I, I, I didn't come to Imperial College, unfortunately. I, I went to Aberdeen University to, to do engineering science, so a little bit about me. No booze, please. Aberdeen is okay. And I was saying to Mary that we had a, a reunion in the summertime um, uh, um, uh, in uh, this summer, actually. And she said, there's a summer in Aberdeen? And I said, well, it's mid-year then, in that case. Um, and and I, I have been in all sorts of areas, wind, hydro, networks, transmission distribution, um, oil and gas even, uh, but not nuclear. And, and so, so very little to do with nuclear, but I'll maybe come back to that. Um, I was asked to obviously deliver this lecture in terms of my current role. And, and I'm really, really excited to do this because nuclear at the core of the energy transition and it's energy transition. I'll come back to that time and time again. It's not just electricity. And, and of course, that, that transition, I guess, um, Probably it's, it's, it's driven because of one thing in particular, and that really is taking fossil fuels out of the whole system. And, and in some ways, I guess, this lecture probably could have been delivered in the 1970s. And, and it would have contained a number of the same things. It was probably over-optimistic then, and it certainly would have been wrong. But 1970s, and I'm seeing some blank faces for the younger contingent up there. It's going, you know, my parents told me about that. So, so if I come to any of these sorts of references, I'll, I'll maybe just suggest that you Google them. You know? um, so, so the energy transition, that transition away from fossil fuels, and, and so, so that, I think, is one of the, the key platforms of this. And I put up this guy. Anyone recognize him? One at the front, okay. And maybe one over there. So, so his name is, uh, is Brian Eno. And, and, and he has nothing to do with nuclear at all. <laughs> but he has everything to do with a lecture being here tonight and not two weeks ago as billed. <laughs> so, so sincere apologies if that caused you any inconvenience. Um, Brian Eno, co-founder of Roxy Music. So there's a few nods at the front. So I'm getting nods at the front and I'm getting nothing at the back. So, so Google Roxy Music. I, I loved Roxy Music. Co-founder with Brian Ferry. And, and I think, you know, a, a really, really, a bit of a hero of mine, I guess. So I was really privileged to have dinner with him a couple of weeks ago. So, okay, you don't, under, don't, don't recognize this guy. What about this guy then? Uh, I mean, he's, he's, he looks more like the guys at the front. Um, <laughs> so obviously he's got something to do with nuclear. Uh, and the answer is, he has. So his name is Henri Becquerel. Um, and unlike Brian Eno, he has everything to do with nuclear. Uh, and he discovered radioactivity by accident. He, was, he, was, he had some uh, uranium salts uh, against some uh, photographic plates. And he, and he saw that the, 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 the uranium salts made an impression on these plates. And, and that was really the first time when radioactivity was, 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 was first uh, discovered, I suppose. He didn't take it much further than that. And uh, Marie Curie uh, and Pierre Curie were the ones who really did in-depth studies into what they then termed as radioactivity. So the, the term radioactivity came from the Curies and not from Henri Becquerel. But there's also a very important anniversary uh, just gone. So on 3rd of December, uh, 1942, so that's 80 years ago this last weekend, um, uh, the world's first self-sustaining controlled nuclear reaction took place in the US. The US National Labs, which were situated in the basement of the University of Chicago football field. Right? So that, that was the first time that, that radioactivity, uh, in terms of being enhanced and controlled, uh, took place. But for me, 
you know, why did I get into nuclear? And, and I grew up in the Highlands of Scotland, and, and there wasn't much around there at the time. There was certainly no engineering in my family at all. But just imagine, if you can, I'm eight or nine years old. And short trousers, big jacket, you know, just really enthusiastic about the world. And I had a school trip to this place. Uh, and this is Dune Ray on, on the north coast of Scotland. And, and the, the bus trip going across, if, and, and anyone's been up there, there's, it's flat for, for ages. And on the horizon, you see this white, white sphere getting closer and closer and closer. And so, you know, an eight or nine year old boy in a processed plant like that, it was just phenomenal. It was, it made such an impression on me. And I think, I look back and I think that's probably the thing that inspired me to do engineering. But the best thing of all was when we left, we were all given a little pencil sharpener in the shape of the dome. And I treasured that for Decades, God knows where it is now. I've moved house too many times. We lost in a packing case somewhere, but, but, but it was it was really inspirational. On my desk all through school, it was just fantastic. So when I got the first call that said, the chair of National Nuclear Lab is up for grabs. Are you interested in applying? The answer in a nanosecond was absolutely. So that's the background. That's why I got into what I got into. And let, let me just, the, the core of the energy transition, it's, it's, it's a future of low carbon energy that we're really talking about and the part that nuclear plays in that. So let me start with COP27 or the whole COP piece because climate change really is, I suppose, is the, the biggest single threat to civilization. And, and that, that's not underestimating how important this whole thing is. Uh, and, and surprisingly, however, at COP27, there was very little discussion on nuclear. There was all sorts of other things and about reparation fees from, large, uh, from rich countries to, to, to vulnerable countries. But there was very, very little, uh, which kind of disappointed me, very little on nuclear. The UK recognizes, of course, its reliance on fossil fuels, North Sea oil, you've been at that for decades. And somewhat belatedly, I suppose, we recognize the need to have low carbon energy and be self-sufficient, i.e. energy security. So as you know, of course, the, the way we behave and the, the, the energy that we use is one of these things that impacts that. You know, people fly on holidays, you know, we have, you know, we eat meat, we drive gas guzzling cars. Um, you know, the culture and the behavior has clearly got to change. So before I continue, so this is, there was going to be questions in the end, and I'm going to change that now. So I'm going to ask you a question first. So show of hands, please. Who all wants planet Earth to survive? <laughs> and I'm just looking at those who haven't put their hands up, <laughs> because you want to keep well away from them. So thank you for that. And that's kind of what I expected. You know, kids, grandkids, all this sort of thing. So, so, here's, so, so, so here's another question then. How many of you know your personal carbon footprint in tons of CO2 per annum? Ooh, right. So eight or nine, I guess, maybe 10 at the most. So, I mean, don't feel bad about it. It's, it's, it's not unusual. And I actually pull this stunt at all sorts of things. I was at the CBI Net Zero conference last year. I asked the audience there, there's about 500 of them, and there was about six people put their hands up. I was at another Net Zero thing, and there was about 14 put their hands up. So, so we, have, we have a ways to go. My own personal carbon footprint is just over 10 tons per annum. There's lots of websites where you can do the calculation, so it's not, it's not difficult to do. Um, 10 tons, that's not great, but, it's, but it, I guess it's not that bad either. But it, it is what it is. I changed my house to uh, air source heat pumps from oil last year. Uh, I have a gas gasoline car. I'm not going to change it early, but when I do change it, I'm going to go electric. I have meat-free Mondays, you know, I do that sort of stuff. I take the train from Edinburgh, which is my home, down here rather than fly. So, so I do the sort of things that I can do. But 
what else do I need to do? I, I have no idea how to get my own personal carbon footprint to zero. And, but at least I know where I'm starting from. So, so, so if you start, at least, then you can think about the journey that you need to take in order to get there. And that's kind of what policy is all about as well. How do you influence a supply chain? How do I influence my own personal supply chain to, to provide me goods and services that are, that are zero carbon? So my only encouragement to you folks is to at least understand where you start from. So this is starting to sound like a lecture now, isn't it? Understand where you start from, because you need to be on that journey. So where are we in terms of, this is the UK. Energy and power to heat our homes, drive our vehicles, drive our social media lifestyle, whatever it is, we consume a lot of energy. And energy consumption, of course, is, is linked to human development. A country can fundamentally enhance the health, the educational standards, the well-being of its population by using more energy. And, and yet, 80% of the world's population use a lot less energy per capita than we do in the UK. So if countries are going to improve th their standards, their living standards, then energy is only going to increase. So the world consumption is going to increase. In 1950, so for the guys at the front, 1950, you remember that. Uh, for those at the back, it's just, just aspirational, but 1950, the world emitted six billion tons of CO2, 1950. By 1990, that had nearly quadrupled to 22 billion tons in 40 years. Now, we emit around about 34 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. And, and that is only growing. The, the, the pace is slowing down, but we have not yet reached the peak. So how can we create an energy system that goes about reducing that in a way that has access to all these other countries who need to consume more in a more just, fair, and, and, and not a very cost-effective way? Electricity also amounts for about 20% of our energy needs, and that is at least going to double by 2050. And, e and electricity, to a degree, is easy to decarbonize. The rest of the energy supply chain, much less so. So heats for our houses, for factories, for, 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 for places like this. So the challenge is great, and we will need all the tools in the toolbox to be able to do that. The CEO of Equinor, so that's the Norwegian state uh, energy company, used to be oil and gas, they do oil and gas, but they do other things as well says the first step towards everything is electrify as much as you can. And that at least will start you on the journey. But what about electric planes, electric ships? Well, Rolls-Royce have got an electric plane out there. It was test flown earlier on this year. Electric ships, I mean, Norway have got a lot of ferries going backwards across the, the fjords that are all electric. They plug in automatically when they reach dock. You know, but, but Super tankers going around the world. If you want to fly to Australia, you're not going to fly in an electric plane. So yeah, there's, there's a lot still to do. And so that, I guess, is the challenge that we have as a society. And so in terms of nuclear, let's go back and let's see where it all started. This is Calder Hall in Cumbria. This is the world's first um, nuclear power station. 1956, October 1956, Google that at the back, opened by Queen Elizabeth II. It was, it was the first atomic power station. It was the dawn of the atomic era. It was futuristic. I mean, look at the, look at the podium that they're standing on. It just looks like science fiction almost. And it was exciting. And I think it would be remiss of me to, 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 to admit the fact that the Americans whilst they, 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 they harnessed that first nuclear reaction, they were behind us when it came to uh, nuclear power stations. So it was a full year later before the Americans entered this piece. And whilst the technology was unknown by the general public, post-war Britain was really embracing the nuclear age, 
the atomic age. And unbelievably, of course, this place from start to finish took three years to build, three years to produce electricity. Now you look at Hinkley, which is 10 plus years. Uh, and it was all built, of course, using slide rules. So again, guys at the front, Google slide rules at the back. It was supposed to be operational for 20 years. It lasted 47 years. It was only closed in 2003. And it just, it was an amazing feat of science and engineering. And it was a start of a nuclear era. And, and it was the first of 26 Magnox reactors uh, across 11 sites, 11 power stations with 26 uh, reactors. The total capacity was 4,400 megawatts, which is, it's, that's only a third bigger. So that total installed base is only a third bigger than, than the, the plant at Hinkley at the moment. The name Magnox came from magnesium alloy, uh, aluminium alloy, which was used to, to, to coat the uh, fuel rods, the uranium fuel rods. So it's magnesium non-oxidizing, shortened to Magnox. The rest of the world, however, didn't follow suit. Uh, and we only sold the, the rights to this to uh, Italy and Japan. But the North Koreans got into this as well. And uh, they based their own Magnox technology uh, on the UK design because we shared the UK design at an Atoms for Peace conference. So the, the, the North Koreans were busy scribbling all the notes down and they went back and they built their own stuff. How naive can you be? Uh, so we're obviously not going to do that again. The rest of the world, however, went to pressurized water re reactors. And, and, and that was almost the, the sort of the different technologies, the difference between the VHS and Betamax technologies. Video recorders, video recorders. So vid Google video recorders and B VHS and Betamax at the top. It's, it's, it's a really interesting debate. So, so that, that, was, that was where the UK was. But undeterred, the UK then built on the technology of, of, of Magnox and produced the AGR, the Advanced Gas Cooled Reactor Fleet. And, and it was just, it was operating at higher temperatures. It was, it was, it was improved efficiency. Um, and, and the first one of these came online in 1976. And a total of 14 of these were built. And these ones, the Magnox reactors, all gone now, but the AGR really are the core of our nuclear fleet at the moment. The pressurized water reactor, we, there, was a, there was a program of six that were going to be built, and we built one. Uh, and, and I'll give you the reason as to why that happened. But at the peak, so we had 13 gigawatts of uh, electricity produced by the nuclear fleet at its height. Now, if you, th if you think about where the government is at the moment, they want to have 24 gigawatts by 2050. So that's, that's the scale of where we want to go, the aspiration that we have as a country. Yeah, and you might say, um, you know, what is, oops, there we go. What, is, what has nuclear ever done for us? It's a bit of a, a spin on the Monty Python line. You know, what have the Romans ever done for us? But the answer is a lot. 66 years of operation, um, 3,000 terawatt hours uh, generated, 2.3 billion tonnes of CO2 saved as a result. It's, 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 a, it's an enormous statistic. And actually, it, it's a legacy. It's an, almost an unsung hero of, of the early fleets that existed. If we had that today, then we would be in a much better place from a UK point of view than we are now. And it also supported a significant research base. 8,000 people, 30 research centers around the country, spending about 350 million a year on research into uh, nuclear R&D. And, and the UK led the world at that point in time. But things change, don't they? And Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, changed the landscape. There was an intention to build six PWRs. Only one was built. The rest were canned. And the whole build program and the whole nuclear sector 
fell into the doldrums. We had pressure groups like Nuclear No Thanks, really pressurizing government policy, um, really saying how unsafe nuclear was, challenging the resilience of politicians, and nuclear was about to take the back seat for decades. The growing public campaign, of course, was, was very, very successful. So in the 80s and 90s, the decline was just uh, tangible. The, the fleet of PWRs, as I say, was, was only one. Nuclear was out, uh, out of favor, and many wondered whether it would or even could ever return to these shores. But things changed, as I say, things, things went for the bad, things went for the better, perhaps. I was at COP26 last week for, for, for the full, uh, last year for the full two weeks, and I came across uh, these folks they had sweatshirts on with uh, Stand Up for Nuclear on it. So I got chatting to them. And uh, just an amazing crowd of folks. A few things, I guess, impressed me. One is they were all in their 30s. Uh, probably two thirds of them, at least, if not three quarters, were female. And, and my chat with these folks was, I thought you guys were all against nuclear. Not so. So Stand Up for Nuclear it represents 160 different organizations worldwide. And, and, and they are absolutely pro-nuclear. And on their stand, they had a little uh, tin of Coke with a, with a little sort of insulating jacket around it. Uh, and on that, it said, if all the power that you ever used came from nuclear, your lifetime waste would fit into this can. And the, um, the global director of stand-up for uh, nuclear is a San Francisco-based uh, and wonderfully named Paris Ortis Wines, and, um, and she, she was so enthusiastic about it. You can Google her as well. She's, uh, she, she's absolutely first class. And I think, I think they're, they're trying to then, with, with a certain demographic at least, try and get more support for nuclear. And of course, if we're going to take that forward, public support is absolutely critical. So the nuclear re renaissance, at least in this country, started. Um, in the early 2000s, there was rumblings of political instability, particularly in Europe. And there was a guy called Putin who turned off the gas taps to Ukraine, and everyone started to get extremely nervous. So by 2008, the UK had a white paper which effectively reversed the no nuclear policy. Nuclear was back on the agenda. The Department of Energy and Climate Change was formed and the policy drivers there were about energy security and low carbon energy, uh, as well as, of course, uh, boosting the economy. Nuclear ticked all those boxes. So after three decades in the doldrums, nuclear renaissance started. Slow, stop start, frustrated by things like Brexit, countless elections, changes of leadership, but at least that roadmap was clear. And in spite of those stop-start challenges, and unbelievably, the outside world sees UK policy in nuclear as being world-class. And I spoke to, I was with a representative of the International Atomic Energy Agency last week, and, and he's, he, he was very clear. He said, the UK leads the world in nuclear policy, which was news to me, a bit of a surprise, but news to me. Because from the inside looking out, it doesn't, sound, it doesn't feel that way, but from the outside looking in, it absolutely did. And it's worth, I suppose, reminding ourselves since 2008, there's been four general elections, six prime ministers, three of whom are there in the last two weeks, I think it was, uh, nine secretaries of state for business and 10 ministers of state for energy. So to say that the whole policy landscape has been stable and those who have drafted it has been stable, uh, simply not true. But what this has done is at least help crystallize the policy. And that's what we see today. We see, we see, I think, some really good signals to the marketplace about how much nuclear we want to build, up to 24 gigawatts by 2050, eight new reactors by 2030. So we have two at Hinkley, two coming up at Sizewell. So we're halfway there. Still got four to go, though. Um, and and the, the establishment of a regulated asset base financing model, which is, I think, really innovative. So there's a number of things there um, that, that, that really has changed the game 
driven largely by energy security and what's been going on in Ukraine, of course. We can't be complacent about it. If we take it for granted that this is going to happen, it won't. But what we can do, at least, is all convene and make sure that those who are driving the policy deliver on their promises. And it's going to be challenging, particularly in the current economic climate, to do so. And if you go back just a few weeks, so Sizewell, which is the next in line after Hinckley, it was on, then it's off, then it's on, then it's off. And as of last week, it's now definitely on. So that, that's, that's good news, at least. And it shows how that future might emerge. And the current, of course, the current workhorses that I mentioned earlier, the advanced gas cool reactors, will, will all come offline round about the end of this decade. Some may be slightly life extended into the next decade, but 25% of our zero carbon generation stops around about the end of this decade. So we need something to replace them. And what will that be? There's different technologies now. One is, obviously, gigawatt reactors, the sort of stuff that's being built at Hinkley. Small modular, advanced modular, and then fusion. And let me just go through all those uh, in, in, in turn. The large gigawatt reactors, so these, these are the sort of things at Hinkley. 3.2 gigawatts, 3,200 megawatts, huge beasts. Um, and, and each will provide about 7% of the UK's electricity needs, not energy needs, electricity needs. And the arguments have raged about how much this has going to, or how much this has cost and how much it's going to cost. And, and the strike price that was agreed with EDF. So this is the government paying effectively, guaranteeing the per unit price. Every unit generated is going to get this price. And when this was that when the contract was signed, everybody was up in arms. It's way too expensive. Now, with energy prices, this looks like damn good value for money. And then, of course, the size of C, next one, and then the next, and the next. But the stumbling block to these huge plants is the cost and who's going to pay for it. And the challenge there, it's, this is beyond the reach of any private sector company. They cannot afford to build these sort of things. And so there's a mechanism derived, at least for Sizewell, where the government put in a stake, 700 million, and also then looked at the RAB financing model, which then attracts inward investors into a share of that. And that, I think, is, and that model, again, is unique the world over. As an aside, of course, these, these gigawatt plants are roughly the same output as the world's largest wind farm, Dogger Bank in the North Sea. And, and so it's, it's roughly the same. Dogger Bank wind farm, however, it has 277 turbines. Each turbine is 250 meters tall. 250 meters Canada, one Canada square is about uh, 236 meters high, about. The shard, just over 300 meters tall. So, and in an area around about the same square kilometers as Greater London. So if you were to build that sort of thing in Greater London, you'd have 277, one Canada squares, all dotted around London. Imagine that if you can. So the technology, however, for these is proven. Plants are being built around the world. The solution exists, but they are expensive. And we are not, because of the, the way in which energy is funded in the UK, we don't rely on the government simply writing orders to say, go and build another one of these. So gigawatt plants have a, a role to play, mainly in reliable base load, but also in grid stability. And if you think about last week in London, whoever was here in London last week, think about it. It was flat calm, so very little wind generated last week. It was grey skies, so not much solar either. The UK was burning 4% of coal last week to keep the lights on. And, and so you need that element of baseload. And 
burning any coal these days is unacceptable to me, and I'm sure unacceptable to many. But that, that's where we have to be. So moving together in tandem, renewables and nuclear together, seems like the ideal solution. Or is smaller better? So new concepts, new designs, small modular reactors as these are, become more palatable, more investable, more affordable by the private sector, uh, and are built largely on production lines. So it's not as though thousands are being built, but one after the other after the other. And these small modular reactors are being promoted by companies such as GE Hitachi and Rolls-Royce. And Rolls-Royce are being partly funded by the UK government to do just this. And the aim is to build 16 of these in the UK, the first by uh, around 2030, and then about 10 by 2035. So the technology's there, but their challenge still remains that, that, that this production process has not yet been proven. And it needs to be, because it you know, has to be repeatable, it's going to be built off site, it's going to be high quality, on cost, on time. But there's some tremendous export opportunities here as well. And Rolls-Royce forecast that the program is going to create around 40,000 skilled jobs around the UK, regional jobs, and probably generate about 50 plus billion for the uh, economy. So large and small scale nuclear, uh, in tandem with renewables, seems to be a bit of the answer. But remember what I said at the start, this is about electricity, it's not about energy. So how do we then heat our homes, how do we power our industry if we're just talking about electricity? So solutions exist, and they exist in the form of advanced reactors, which are operating at higher temperatures. So current reactors are around 300 degrees, the advanced reactors around 700 to 950 degrees. And these, are these AMRs, advanced modular reactors, uh, encom encompass several different nuclear technologies, but the UK government has gone for a high temperature gas reactor. And why the clues in the name? It's about temperature. And so beyond electricity, of course, you then think about what does an energy system actually look like. And you can imagine in this sort of scenario an advanced reactor providing high grade heat and electricity to hard to decarbonize uh, sectors. Glass making, steel making, paper making, hydrogen production, all these sorts of things. So, so th this type of scenario I think is, is, is one where uh, that technology is clearly going to fit. So producing electricity as well as high-grade heat. But we're not starting from scratch. Some of these technologies have been around even in the UK for some time. But the reason they've never been developed is nobody, nobody wanted high-grade heat. There, there wasn't that pool to say we want electricity and we want high-grade heat to power our industries. So that, I think, is a, a game-changer where at least at least the whole net zero legislation is driving companies to, to look at ways in which they can do this sort of thing. And even a campus like this is, you know, where do you get your heat from? Well, CHP plants at the moment, so, you know, but what else are you going to do beyond that? So it's a, it's a real challenge for the built environment. The resurgence in nuclear research in the last five years, again, there's been a significant resurgence in this country, really changing the trend of decline that I spoke about earlier. We've been building capability and capacity. The National Nuclear Lab is growing like Bilio at the moment. Uh, we, together with a number of partners, are, are operating in a, a fund, 180 million nuclear innovation program, and that includes 118 companies, 27 universities, three national labs, four international labs. So, so there's a lot of activity going back into research and development now. But how do we fuel these labs? Uh, how do we fuel the advanced reactors? This takes a lot of R&D. This is one of the core uh, deliverables for the National Nuclear Lab. 
the fuel needs to be incredibly robust, operating at such high temperatures. And, and this uh, fuel is a, is, a, is a coated particle fuel. Each particle is the size of a poppy seed. It is that small. So you can imagine the technology that goes into making coated fuels like this. A single poppy seed will power three kettles. Three poppy seeds are worth about a kilogram of coal. 3,000 poppy seeds will power your home for a year. These high temperature reactors um, uh, can help to decarbonize the, the industries as well as provide electricity. And it really does put nuclear at the core of the energy transition. But I can't ignore fusion. Fusion is undertaken by a, a different national lab. And the research has been carried out. Uh, and the UK has, is, I guess, a world leader in fusion. And fusion, what is it? It's the power of the sun. How do you take a slice of the sun and stick it into a controlled environment? Really, really difficult. But the promise of limitless energy with minimal waste is just uh, the holy grail that everybody has been looking for since the 1950s, Google 1950s. But is it within reach? I mean, when I was a kid, fusion was 10 years away. By 2050, my bet is it's probably going to be close to 10 years away by then. You know, I think the, the, the lab looking at this is, is looking at getting power out of the, the reactor on the right-hand side. So this is, this is a, um, the one on the left-hand side is the joint European Taurus at Cullum. Um, and, and, and basically, that is a huge magnetic field to control the plasma, uh, which, which sits within it at extremely high temperatures. So there's a huge amount to do in terms of not just nuclear physics, but in materials, all these sort of things. How do, we, how do you contain this sort of thing and sustain it uh, indefinitely? The UK holds a world record for producing power out of there. But nevertheless, that's only for a small, a very small period of time. So there's a lot of work still to do. So maybe 2050, maybe, maybe longer than that. My, my bet is probably longer. It's an extremely difficult thing to do. But we are the world leaders in this. And we have a lot of joint international partners. And the STEP program, which is the one on the right-hand side, is, is one that's going to be built at West Burton. So the government have bought the land. That's where they're going to build it. And, and that's where some of the uh, new technologies, a lot of R&D is going to go into that piece. So what about the future? What about benefiting broader society? I've talked a lot about energy, a lot about electricity. What next? Well, space is next, the final frontier. Star Trek, anyone at the back? No? no? OK. Google it. Um, it's, it's, this, is, this is an important part. There's a lot of research going into this from the National Lab. And the exploration, of course, of outer space, you know, further moonshots, that sort of thing. Dark side of the moon missions where you can't have solar panels to power your equipment. You need little reactors. And these things are little. They're, they're, I saw a, a, a piece of one last week. It's about 30 centimeters in diameter, 40 centimeters high. But it, but it powers these things for a long time. And, uh, it, but it's been on the go for, well, since 1960s. Voyager 1 was launched in, on the 5th of September 1977, and it's still on the go and still phoning home. It is 18 billion kilometers away from Earth. So it still phones home, ET. So it's not a new concept, but there are better, or maybe there are better ways of doing it. The issue with this is that the radioisotopes used were of plutonium. And anyone who's heard about nuclear, you shudder at plutonium because it's nasty. Uh, and it is. I mean, it's a very limited supply. It comes from the US or Russia. And typically, it comes from historic military programs. So that's not ideal. So the UK has been looking at how do you extract materials, americium particularly, out of existing waste in order to power these things. And that's exactly what the nuclear lab is doing. And the challenge for us is we know how to do it, 
All we need to do is upscale it to get enough material out so that we can power these things and the challenge is to do that by 2030. And that's exactly what the nuclear lab has done. So, so the, there's a challenge that is literally out of this world. And one for me which is very much in this world is, is cancer treatment. I mean, I mentioned earlier that climate change is one of the, the big challenges for society, but so is cancer. You know, around 50% of us will have some exposure, some form of cancer in our lifetime. It's, it's, it's a very, very sobering statistic. But this is a really exciting piece of R&D. And the medical science people are similarly excited. So th this is about how, how you extract radioisotopes um, from waste and attach them to uh, carrier cells that effectively attach themselves to cancer. And like all applications, of course, it is that marriage between the radioisotope, which is lead, uh, and, and, that, and that carrier. And the great advantage of this is, is that when, when the isotope is attached, it, it will kill everything within a few cell diameters. So attached to a cancerous cell, it will kill everything just around about it. Not like chemotherapy that kills good and bad. But there are around 40 million nuclear medicine procedures every year. But they tend to be for diagnosis only uh, and not for, uh, for any cures. So here, two parts, the targeting module itself uh, and then the alpha therapy uh, isotope that, that, that is attached to it. And, and early indications are, so the piece on the left are, are all the types of cancers that we think can be cured, or the medical teams at least think can be cured by this. And on the right-hand side, a patient trial after two doses, two doses only, uh, the, 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 the uh, growth of the, of, the cancers, of the cancers themselves have shrunk and disappeared significantly. And that's why there's so much excitement. It's very, very early days yet. But, and there's a lot of clinical trials still to do. But, but those who are working at the, with this, it's, it is, uh, it's worth fighting for. It is a, a, a treatment that absolutely is worth fighting for. So our efforts in nuclear medicine are increasing. They are, we used to lead the world in a lot of these isotopes. We don't anymore, but we are working back towards that and very much back in the frame. And I think the trends of the last few decades are certainly reversing, which puts the UK back in, not just for uh, things like medicine, but also for energy. And I think it's a, it's a very important part of the National Nuclear Laboratory's work. So to summarize, I guess, where are we? Nuclear science for the benefit of society. That's our mission. Clean energy, climate change, society's greatest challenge. Nuclear science for exploring new worlds. Nuclear science to help treat us. Nuclear at the core of the energy transition, and I think it could be much, much more. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We have time for Q&A, questions and answers, and so we welcome those from both the audience and those of you viewing this online. So if you haven't asked questions on Slido yet, please do. We will see them on the screen. Probably alternate between the audience and Slido. And um, so um, we're going to do this on microphone. So we've got a couple of roving mics, and I will deliver... Fei Tang is going to deliver one of those. In fact, we have a question at the back. We'll start there. You, you, yes. Please uh, state your name and affiliation. That always is good to hear. Hi, I'm Nick. Um, I'm from the general public. I'm not actually a student of nuclear science, but um, 
I think one thing I need to make, I've always been braver in nuclear power, and the trouble is, I think the Green movement have their own first enemies, and Greenpeace, I believe, still are anti-nuclear, and very recently, some other green group, like Friends of the Earth, dumped a load of coal, sacks of coal outside their offices. Until the Green movement gets out of this stupid nonsense about being anti-nuclear, we're never going to win this battle with global warming, because they're their own, this is the it's part of the solution, as you say, not part of the problem. How are we going to get around these, these heck bangers, basically? <laughs> so, uh, are there any behavioral scientists in the room? Because it's, uh, it, 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 listen, the, 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 there's, there's a lot of opposition, not just in the UK, but elsewhere as well. And, 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 and to say that, that the nuclear power, no thanks, lobby has gone away would, would be a fallacy. But I think the next generation, if you, if you look at the people who are still... Uh, anti-nuclear, they tend to be the older generation, the CND folks, but you look at a number of people, and my experience of these folks, the younger generation are much more for it. Now, do we have to wait until the others are on the other side of the grass in order to move forward? Don't know. Thank you. So we're going to go for the uh, top voted uh, question so far. Um, does generating nuclear waste align with sustainable development given its definition, including reference to allowing future generations to... Good. A, gr a, great, a great question. Nuclear waste, uh, you know, as I said, the, you know, the personal waste in a, in a, in a Coca-Cola can uh, certainly inspired me, at least. Because if you think about the waste that comes from normal generation, it is, you know... Uh, from a personal point of view, you'd probably fill half this room. So it's, 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 it's one of these things, it is a difficult topic. We've not dealt with it particularly well in the UK up to now. But if you look at the NDA and nuclear waste services and all these sorts of organisations which are, are now really tackling nuclear waste, I mean, we're part of that solution as well in terms of you know how, how do you compress nuclear waste how do you how do you get it into a smallest physical point or physical containers you possibly can and, and and there are there are i think two sites that the uk plc are looking at in terms of where to store this stuff it's a huge problem for the uk countries like sweden however tackled it years ago you know, they, they've got waste repositories there that are open to the public. You can go and have a look if you want. It's, you know, so, so we, are, we are behind the eight ball when it, when it comes to nuclear waste. Um, and it is, but it is a problem that is, that is grabbing attention and is being hugely funded in order to get to solutions. I hope that answers the slider question. Great. We're going to take two questions from the audience. The gentleman in... Just here, and then we'll come to you. Hello, uh, Robert Cumming, uh, just a member of the public. It's a basic question. The, the guaranteed price for the uh, Hinkley uh, development uh, for electricity, how does that compare with the price that, of wind uh, energy? I know that they've got different sustainabilities and the wind yeah. stops sometimes. So, so, so from memory, uh, the strike price for Hinkley was about £98 a megawatt. Uh, wind is now under 40 and some of it getting close to 30. So, so, the, so, so there is, there is a, a significant difference and that's the reason why there was so much, uh, I, I suppose, disgust at the, at the contract that, that, that uh, the EDF won. The deal, however, was when the next one was built, so Sizewell will be a copy-paste of, of Hinkley, and, and, and that has to go down by about 20%, so it's, it goes from £98 down 20% or whatever, 80-something or other. That's one here. So I'm Patrick O'Brien, I'm from the general public as well, and believe it or not, I came down from Aberdeen. Have oh, a lot to fantastic. do with the University of Aberdeen, so good to hear uh, some people from Scotland here. That's very good. Yeah, and thank you for your talk. Actually, I was very interested to be here and and very pleased with with, with, with what I've learned. So thanks for that. Um, and so when I ask a question a little bit, because I'm not familiar with nuclear, 
maybe, maybe my question isn't fully in context, so I, I, I put that in context, if you like. So when we talked earlier about the opposition, if you like, or to nuclear, um, and uh, so forth like that, actually I was, I was surprised in your presentation that you, you maybe didn't deal with the issue of either safety or waste, if you like, because, I mean, as engineers, we have a responsibility to explain that side to people. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are people out there who are in opposition, then there must be facts. Actually, we have a long experience here. There must be facts that can explain that the issue of safety is not really an issue mm -hmm. or whatever. So are we just not good at communicating that? And again, to bring back to the point, I was surprised you didn't raise it in your presentation at all. Mm -hmm. So if there is opposition to nuclear, why is it there and why can't we sort this one? I, yeah, there, there is. If, if the message doesn't get across, uh, my, my philosophy is always if the message doesn't get across, it's not because the recipients don't understand it, it's because the person who's trying to communicate hasn't done it properly. So, 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 so that, 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 that's number one. And I think, I think there's a lot to do still you know, in terms of this. It, it, it was not, there was, I think when nuclear first started, it, it, was, it was ignorance. There was a lot of acceptance because nobody knew anything about it. People are much better informed these days. Um, I mean, Scotland, of course, is supposed to be a nuclear-free zone as well, isn't it? Um, I don't know how that's going to work, but nevertheless, it, you know, it's, it's supposed to be. And I think it's, so, so safety, I mean, safety criticality is one of these things that is, and again, that's understood much, much better now than ever it was before. So these nuclear incidents that have happened, including things like Fukushima, the, 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 the degrees of, of safety and protection, so you don't rely on, 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 on a single point failure anymore. You have two points or three points of failure. And, and that, that's, that's one of the reasons that things like uh, Hinkley Point are so expensive is because there's multiple points of failure. It's the same as an aircraft, you know. You don't want a single point of air failure in an aircraft. So, so I, think, I think understanding that more, I think the French, the French have done that better than we have, I think. I think there's more acceptance there. The point about waste is, is a thorny subject. I think it's, it's, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about waste over the decades, certainly I can remember. Uh, not all good. And, and I think the UK has a lot to do yet to clean up its act in order to be able to communicate that or what we're doing properly. Uh, there's also the security issue, I think. You know, there's certain things that I, I, I guess you can talk about. Uh, and I'm talking about terrorism here. I'm talking about you know, outside agencies. So I'm just looking to see if anyone looks a bit North Korean around here. No. But it's, 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 you know, there, there's things like that, I think. You know, we, we were a bit naive in the past about what we did and how we communicated it. We have to be careful not to do that again. Would be my view. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, we'll come to your question in a moment. We'll take the two questions that are top of the Slido now, because I think you've started an answer. What's changed to make the new reactors so expensive? And then that... Um, Second question, what does the national grid need to do? You might wish to answer those two. So actually, interestingly, sorry, can we go, go back to the, that question? Uh, so can, what, what, why, are, why, why, why are they so why costly? They? So, so part, part of it, so the, so the, the French design uh, was, had multiple layers of failure in it, and, 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 and that's right and proper. But, but they, they have looked at that design. So the next generation of these Hinkleys, which are being built in France, and I think there's going to be at least six of them. And I was talking to the French embassy uh, last week about this. So they, they were, they're, they're, they're now re-looking at the design to take out some cost out of that. So, 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 so they will be more cost effective. There are other designs as well, which we haven't got in the UK yet. Like, you know, so there's other providers too. <laughs> Um, and, and so I think there's, there's uh, and some, some of those can be built more quickly. Uh, the technology is probably slightly older, more proven, uh, and, 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 and yet, you know, the cost is significantly lower. So, so I, think, I think from a cost point of view, everybody looks at cost. And, and even the difference between Hinkley and Sizewell is about a 20% difference. 
that there's a huge amount of cost goes into engineering and getting it right first time. When you copy paste these things, you should be able to make them much, much cheaper than the first one. And the third one, cheaper than the second one. So the, hopefully that answers the question. What was the, what was the other one? Don't want the national grid question. Oh, the national grid question. Um, whew. Right, so how many hours have you got for this one? Um, so in, in, ter in terms of the nuclear stations, the, all the nuclear stations are being built on existing sites. So the national grid infrastructure is already there. Doesn't, it, there's, a little, there's a few enhancements need, need to happen. So you know, there's a, a new substation at Hinkley, there's a new, new connection arrangement. But, but, but effectively, it's built in areas of the country where the infrastructure already exists. The, 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 the question's slightly broader than that, of course. You know, what does National Grid need to do? And, and the answer is quite a lot, because not only are they having to cope with that, but they're also having to cope with uh, a, a huge increase in offshore wind. You know, and how do you get that to the load centers? Um, how do you even connect all that lot up? They have huge planning issues on the East Coast, because every time you connect a wind farm, you build a huge big gray box and that does that upsets the locals tremendously so so there's a there's a there's, there's a big project un, underway at the minute which the ESO are, are overseeing which is effectively a North Sea grid so you're building exactly the grid we have in the U, in, in on land and you're you're building a, a parallel one offshore a subsea cable grid so so there's a lot of that but from a nuclear connection point of view the connection points largely already exist there's a gentleman about three rows from the back. And then one further down. Hi there, thank you. My name's uh, Liam from the general public. Um, a lot of the questions that I see up here and what we've talked about is the generation of, of energy and what happens with the waste. But what about the fuel cycle and the front end of, of this? Um, and so how do you think about working with the mining companies that produce the uranium, the enrichment companies that enrich the uranium, the, and then build, making the fuel, the fuel pellets to go into the, the reactors. And how do we get to a situation unlike we are today where we're reliant on Russian gas? Because my understanding is that Kazakhstan is a large producer of uranium, Russia's uh, a large producer of your rich, enriched uranium, and so how do we make it so we're not in a situation like we are today with the gas? That's a, that's a, a really great question, a penetrating one. I'm not sure I can answer all of it, but uh, the reliance on unfriendly states you know, is clearly an issue for, for all of us, and we're going to have to learn to live apart from that. The, the, w the way in which and I'm not an expert in mining or sourcing of raw materials at all, but but I know enough to be able to to, to say, look, you know, we, we we have to use the the facilities that we have more and more, and maybe that's one. I mean, we we do so. The national lab does a lot of analysis on fuels, existing fuels at existing sites. You know, we, we, you know, part of the part of that whole fuel cycle and part of the life extension of some of these plants is, is about is about how you how you treat fuel and 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 is is the reactor and all its ancillaries fit for purpose for longer. So the advanced gas cool reactors, which 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 now EDF are trying to life extend, maybe some of them for as much as ten years. Uh, you know, we, we have to make sure that the fuels, the existing fuels, can actually uh, cope with that. So the fuel analysis piece is something that the National Lab absolutely gets involved in. In terms of the raw materials, we don't. And, 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 uh, but, there, but I understand the challenge. It's the same as many raw materials. And if, we're ta you know, if we had this lecture about batteries, you know, what, about, what about all the raw materials for batteries? You know, that, that, that's going to run out in some time, isn't it? So, so I think I think there's a real challenge there in terms of how we, as as a as a globe, manage commodities uh, in a way that we'd recognise that they are have limits and are not sustainable. They are not infinite. How we do that is as much a political challenge, I think, as it is a, an engineering one. Does that answer the question? 
Okay, I think we, the, the lady in, in blue, about five rows up. Hello, this is Ines. Uh, I'm a student here at Imperial. Um, I wanted to ask about the future of nuclear. So you were talking about the AGRs, about the, about the modular reactors, and then you also brought up fusion. And so I wanted to ask in the hypothetical next 10 years when it comes online, how does that fit in with the current mix that we're building, right? Because right now we want to diversify our energy mix, we want to have proportions of everything, but then you come to a point where you have fusion, which is limitless energy for whatever you want, right? So would we just turn everything that we've been working on off? Would we have a small fraction of it? How do you see that happening? So, so, so th th this is where I'm going to be wrong, okay? So I can only ever be wrong on this sort of thing. Ask me in 30 years time and I'll, uh, and I'll tell you. Um, I, I mean, if, if fusion works, then, then that solves so many problems. Do you turn everything else off? Well, I mean, hopefully by then, everything else in terms of polluting everything else has already been turned off. Um, but, you know, for me, fusion is, a, is, is, it is the holy grail. It, it, is, it is something that, that is sustainable if we can harness the technology, if we can harness something that is extremely difficult. And there's as much a materials issue as there is a, a, a sort of nuclear issue in terms of fusion. So, so I think, I think they are, I, it'd be a brave person to turn everything off. I think it would gradually, we'd, would we need, I mean, back to the fuels issue, you know, would we have a fuels issue of uranium if we had nuclear fusion cracked? Well, the answer is no. You know, it, it's, it, it solves so many problems for us. But getting to fusion is so challenging. Ian, we'd like you to answer the where does or should nuclear waste from the UK go? Um, well, as I said at the beginning, there's, there's, um, there's two sites being identified. Uh, it's certainly not something we should export. Clear in my head, the, it should stay in the UK. We, we should have a proper repository, a bit like Sweden. Sweden do this extremely well. Uh, there's no reason why we can't. There's some challenges to get there. And of course, there's going to be all sorts of planning issues associated with those two sites. But, um, but you, look at, you, know, you look at Cumbria as a, as a, as a, a, a nuclear center of excellence, if you like, global center of excellence for, you know, for nuclear. Um, you know, why would you not have those things there? So it, it, don't export it. Would be my, you're not going to give it to somebody else and have it somebody else's problem. Not in my view. Okay, we're going to take the last two questions from the audience. I think we can see the hands. Hi, I'm Paul from EDF, and Ian, thank you for the fascinating um, talk. I guess um, I'd be fascinated to go back to what you talked about at uh, COP, where you talked about the, the young folk and the, um, particularly the women who are advocating for nuclear, and I wonder what your reflections are on the, the current gender divide that you see in attitudes to nuclear, where support is stronger amongst middle-aged and older men and less strong among <laughs> young women. Thanks, thanks, Paul. And, and I hope I got the strike price right, did I? 92.50. Oh, 92.50, sorry, sorry, okay, right. It was from my memory, thanks anyway. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, as I say, this, this Stand Up for Nuclear uh, team uh, they represent 160 organizations worldwide. And, and I was asking them just the sort of organizations, they're not all in 160 countries, but, but they're quite a, quite a global spread. Um, there, there is, I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's part of it, you know, as generations grow up and, and they understand better, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, they're, maybe they're advocates, maybe they're not, I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's about behavior as well, perhaps. Maybe it's about, you know, the easy way out is to like something or dislike it uh, without understanding more about it. it it's, it's a behavioral challenge, which I think is, you know, is one that impacts us all, I suppose. 
Um, I, I hope, back to the communication issue, that we can communicate these things better. I mean, I think EDF have done a brilliant job down at Hinkley with apprentices, for example. A thousand apprentices on site, 1,500 will be created at Sizewell. You know, so, I mean, that, that, that has a huge effect in a, in, a, in a rural community. So you hope these messages start to go out, you know, as we, as we start to, you know, build this programme out. And, and messages going out in a very positive way, I think. So, you know, we're, we're, we're just coming out of the, you know, 30 years of not having done anything. And, and you know, all credit to EDF in terms of getting to where you are so far in Hinkley. I think that's a, that's a fantastic place to be. And I think if we can demonstrate that and these future programmes as well, then I think we, we slowly but surely, and Paul and I have been talking about this, about you know, positioning ourselves as a sector and as a national lab. EDF have done everything they need to do in positioning themselves, and no more, please. You know? but, but I think the rest of the sector have got to, a lot more still to do. I'm afraid it's our last question. The gentleman in, in orange has been very patient. We will um, <laughs> give you this. Thanks sir, for a fascinating talk. My name's Andrew. I'm a member of the public, which I think is like a popular group tonight. So I'm also here as a parent, which is probably makes me vested in beyond my own, own lifetime. Um, you highlighted sort of the Renaissance in the 2000s, but also the very pivotal role that po politics and political leaders play and how uncertain, how changeable, how short term that is. And can't help feeling we could do with more you know, physics and economics. I couldn't think of a third P in government rather than PPE. But, uh, <laughs> but perhaps my real question is, do you think COVID, in the way it's opened the science up to the general public, gives us an opportunity on something like nuclear, a more complex long-term issue, to actually, you know, bring education, the importance of it and the role it can play, you know, because uh, I think people have got used to, a bit more used to scientists explaining things that are hard, but actually really, really important. It's a great question. Yeah, it's it's. I had not thought about that at all. That, that that that's really put me on the back foot. It's it's yeah. It's 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 interesting. I think that there's there, there's so much more uh, ability to be able to you know to do that and and it's it's that whole communication thing. I think you know that, that we talked about as well as 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 you've, as you've said. It, it, but it's getting more out there. You know, more informed. I would rather have decisions made by well-informed individuals rather than ill-informed individuals. And, and, and that goes from a political point of view as well as, you know, back to Paul's question, you know, you know who's going to be supporting this in the future and who's not going to be supporting this. So, so I, think, I think the sector, uh, there, was, there, was an, there was an industry um, session last week, um, you know, fantastic conference, lots of great stuff. And you just think some of that should be going out there because there's so, there's so much good news here. And skills development uh, from from you know apprentices, you know the EDF piece. I mean, we, we sponsor something like 120 PhDs around the country, and and you know so so and, and everything in between. So so that there is a huge opportunity for folks to get involved in that sort of thing, uh, and we find it in Cumbria at least extremely easy to recruit people to you know a cheaper part of the country. In a, in a sector that they believe in, uh, with the skills and the knowledge and the you know, academic studies that, you know, that sit behind them. And, and, it's, and, it, and it's, it's, it's the good life for many. So, so you copy paste that around about the different nuclear organizations that exist in the UK, all the way through to NDA and to you know, those that are building new ones and Great British Nuclear, which will kind of oversee that build program. Uh, you know, the opportunities for, for kids these days in that sector is enormous and hugely positive. And that's one of the reasons I joined the organisation. Ladies and gentlemen of the audience here at Imperial, those online, would you join me in thanking Ian for the Energy Futures Lab annual lecture? <laughs>